The Nikon D7500, their newly announced APS-C camera, one of their DX cameras, so it has a 1.5X crop. Let's talk about it. I know I'm a few days late here, but I still wanted to go over it. It's a 21 megapixel sensor, the same sensor that we saw in the D500. So we already know what the image quality is going to be like. And in fact, I pretty much know every aspect of this camera. There's nothing new here. It's just kind of hobbled together from different parts of other cameras. So we can discuss pretty thoroughly how it's going to perform without even actually using it, because we've used a lot of these cameras. It has eight frames a second, which is a step down from the D500 at 10 frames a second, but it's a step up from the predecessor, the D7200 at six frames a second. It has the same focusing system as the D7200, which was always a good focusing system. This gives you a sense for how far the AF points spread across the frame. And you can see it's got pretty good coverage. Um, the 7D Mark II is the closest competitor in the Canon world, and you can see it's, it's pretty similar amounts of coverage. On the other hand, the D500 has these focusing points that just literally go right to the corners of the frame. It's pretty fantastic to work with because you can easily use off-center compositions even when tracking moving subjects. So, of course, we would have liked to have seen this autofocus system in the D7500, but they had to save something for the more expensive camera. The D500 is going the D7500 is going for $1,250 whereas the D500 is a big step up from that at $2,000. Otherwise, um, the, the AF system is otherwise unchanged from the D7200, but they did add group AF, which is a minor step up. It's not a, a huge, it's not something I personally would care about. I would have loved to have seen, have seen like 3D tracking from the D500, but again, they need something to differentiate the different models. They're also adding in the D500 and D5's auto AF fine tune system, which uses the uh, off sensor phase detect and on sensor contrast detect systems compares them and will allow you to do some micro adjustments on lenses, which is something either you are extremely passionate about or you do not care about at all. But if you're the type who's been micro adjusting your lenses, that's that's a big deal. What I think is the single biggest development in the D7500 is a bigger buffer. When we reviewed the D7200, check our channel if you want to see that, the, the biggest problem I had was that it was essentially unusable for any sort of action, sports or wildlife, because of a very small buffer. Um, it, it would start buffering after about a second of shooting, <laughs> when, when shooting raw. So essentially you had to always shoot action with JPEG. And that can be okay. Depends on the lighting. If you're shooting indoor sports, that's often okay. But if you're shooting, say, wildlife against a bright sky, you really need that extra dynamic range of the raw files if you're going to make good quality images. So in many ways, the D7200 was a, a non-starter for that kind of thing. Another new addition over the D7200 is a tilting screen, which we think is a, a big deal. I love tilting screens. The D500 has a tilting screen. And if you haven't used one, it allows you to hold the camera up over a crowd and tilt the screen down and use live view. Or if you don't want to lay down your belly in the ground, you can get low angle shots by tilting the screen outwards. For, for things like video where you're often shooting on a tripod, it can really save your back. Uh, anyway, I, I love a tilting screen, but the Nikons have a real problem in that Nikon has yet to develop a good live view autofocus system. It's always torturous to try to focus with live view. It's just it's just really frustrating. I mean, it, it will autofocus, but when you use other cameras that autofocus pretty well with live view, the Nikon is a little bit maddening. So it can get there, but sometimes it will just miss. Um, another big, uh, one big step down from the D7200 is that they took away the dual card system. So now there's just one SD card in the D7500. And to me, that's a, that means I simply can't recommend it to any professional photographers. I know there are lots of pros out there who only use one SD card, and Nikon knows this too. That's probably why they took it out, to save a few bucks, knowing that a lot of people don't care. But you just need to have one SD card fail for one important shoot, and you will always insist on having dual SD cards after that. And we've had four or five fail over the years. Not, we don't even have one fail every year, but every couple of years, we'll have an SD card fail. And for that reason, we pretty habitually always use two cards and write to both cards because cards fail. Some people will think they don't fail or you just have to get good quality cards, but those people have just been lucky. And that means like your number can come up. So please don't shoot weddings or professional sports or anything that you can't stand to lose on a D7500. 
if that's your situation, you need to step up to the D500 or save yourself a few bucks and get the D7200, which is still a great camera for people who aren't shooting sports. Uh, like the D500 as a 100% uh, 1x viewfinder, which just means the viewfinder is about as big and bright as it can get. And indeed, the viewfinder, it's an optical viewfinder, an old-fashioned style viewfinder, not an electric viewfinder, but it looks good. This camera shoots 4K video, but I should say it's like 4K video with little quote signs because it, it technically shoots 4K video. It has that feature, and that's what Nikon wanted, but when we tested the D500 and the D5 and really tried to film something with it, we found them to be unbearable to use. Poor Justin hated having to film with these things because, as I mentioned, the contrast-based autofocusing is an absolute nightmare, and even things like manual focusing are more difficult because they don't, say, support focus peaking or like automatic focus magnification. And in general, it was just a, a difficult and clumsy workflow trying to film 4K with these things. We, we've been shooting and producing 4K video since, um, I think, April of 2014. So we've been doing it for three years now. We have a lot of experience. I would never recommend the D500 or, or any Nikon at this point for people who want to shoot 4K. Instead, I would send you over to a GH4 or a GH5. We've also been using the Sony a7R2 for a long time. Now, the GH5 and the a7R2 are much more expensive cameras than the $1,250 D7500. And in fact, at that price point, it's, it's pretty good that you have the option of shooting 4K. Um, but still, I might point you at a used GH4, which you could get for about a grand, or you could look in the Fuji world. They have fantastic 4K cameras at like the X-T20 does a great job with 4K video. It's limited to 30 minutes internal, um, which is pretty typical. Most cameras are like that, though the, if you want to record longer, the GH4 or the GH5 will record 4K indefinitely. Maybe one of, the, one of the biggest disadvantages to the way it records 4K is that it does it with an additional 1.5x crop, which means in full frame terms, it's like a 2.2 times crop, which means the sensor size, the recording size is actually smaller than a micro four thirds Panasonic GH5. It means that if you put on an 18 millimeter lens at 18 millimeters, then you're actually going to be shooting at an equivalent of 27 millimeters. Yes, yeah, 27 millimeters. So suddenly when you switch to video, everything gets much tighter. And that means it's simply impossible to shoot super wide angle stuff. It means that if you're looking through the viewfinder and you want to record, you might then have to change lenses if you have that option at all. Um, and that definitely kind of slows down the workflow thing and, and gets kind of frustrating. Nikon doesn't seem to have developed that technology that will allow them to take uh, additional megapixels and cram them down. That's something that Fuji can do, Panasonic can do, um, Olympus can do it uh, just about everybody except for Canon and Nikon can do that at that point. So it's doing a one-to-one -one readout from the sensor. And that's how we arrive at an eight megapixel 4K image from the original 21 megapixel sensors. They just crop out eight megapixels from the middle at a 16 by nine ratio. It does have HDMI out in case you wanted to use a field monitor. But again, if you're serious enough that using field monitors, this probably isn't the 4K camera for you. Like other recent Nikon cameras, it features Nikon SnapBridge, which is an awful way to get cam pictures from your camera over to your smartphone for sharing. Um, in our initial review of the D500, I had a good experience with SnapBridge, but I, I liked it so much that I then brought the D500 everywhere on our travels, and I grew to absolutely hate it because SnapBridge proved to be extremely inconsistent and unreliable. So while it does work great sometimes, and that might be enough to get some reviewers, including ourselves, to give it positive marks over the life, it's been extremely annoying to use. And Nikon has released several updates for it. And in fact, they have improved some scenarios, but um, I, I used it, I tried to use it just a couple of weeks ago and it again failed for me on both my Android device and my iPhone device. So it'll fail and then literally like an hour later you'll see a bunch of pictures get transferred over and you're like why, why did you decide to send that stuff now sometimes it'll be days later and suddenly it'll just start sending old pictures to my phone whereas i had spent an hour trying to get it to work i cannot figure out how to get snapbridge to work reliably despite having actually worked with nikon support trying to get it to work maybe they'll release updates maybe snapbridge will get better but if 
Wi-Fi, if transferring images to your phone wirelessly is important to you, I would urge you not to buy one of the SnapBridge cameras. The D7200 was Nikon's first camera to have Wi-Fi, so pick that one up instead. It They've raised the ISO limit up to ISO 1.64 million with extended ISOs or an ISO 52000 native, and this is meaningless because they could make it ISO 1 billion. It's just like software magnification. So I'm glad that they give you the opportunity, but please don't read this to mean it's fantastic in low light. It's going to be exactly like the D500 is in low light, which is pretty much the same as the D7200 was, which is the same as the D5500 and the D5300 and the D3300 and the D3500. So all these Nikon APS-C cameras from the last maybe four years or so all produce about the same image quality. You're not going to get uh, better low light images by upgrading to the D7500. And in fact, because it's only 20 megapixels or 21 megapixels, you'll actually get a, a little bit less detail than when you than you would get out of your D7200. So as I mentioned, it's $1,250. It should be available in the summer of this year. You can pick one up at sdp.io slash D7500. Let's go over some comparisons uh, for other cameras, but first let's talk about who it's for and who we will end up recommending it to. I think at this price point, it makes a good option for amateur wildlife and sports photographers. The focusing system in the D7200, which it inherits, is good. It's not nearly as good as the focusing system in the D500 or D5, but it's solid. It'll do for flying birds and sports. And the higher frame rate and fixing the buffer make it a good camera for that sort of action. If you're shooting landscapes, uh, maybe it's a better choice over the D5500 because it has a more rugged body. It maybe it can handle a little bit of bad weather a little bit better. That's the kind of thing is kind of impossible to, to really test. I still really like the older Nikon D5300 um, because it has a lot of nice features and you can pick one up really inexpensively and it effectively has a, a, actually a better sensor than the D7500 because it's, it's higher megapixels. Um, they also have screens that flip forward, which offer some additional utility. So just something to think about. Side by side with the D7200, you can see the form factor hasn't really changed. The camera is about the same size. Looking at the back, you can see they've added that tilting screen, but not much else has changed. The layout should be extremely familiar to you if you've been shooting with a D7200 and you want to upgrade for that bigger buffer. The D7200 is going new now for about $1,000 or $700 used, so it's a little bit cheaper than the D7500. And I'm going to urge a lot of people to pick up a D7200 instead. If you're not shooting action, you should get a D7200 and take that extra money and put it towards lenses or lighting or something else. The extra, 24 me the extra 3 megapixels on the D7200 will get you some extra detail. The sharper the lenses you use, the more you'll appreciate those extra three megapixels if you aren't using, like if you're using the kit lens, you will be just fine with the, D, with the 21 megapixel D7500. You will definitely appreciate any sort of action because the D7500 will not slow down. But with only one memory card, if that fails, you lose your entire shoot. And how much does that cost you? Well, if you're an amateur, it doesn't cost you anything. If you just shot somebody's wedding, it could cost you your career and thousands and thousands of dollars. So clearly that's not going to be an acceptable option for you. And you should either revert back to a D7200 or upgrade to the $2,000 D500. The D7500 also has a touchscreen, which is something we really like, especially for, for focusing during video. But the SnapBridge is a definite downgrade from the previous generation Wi-Fi that we had on the D7200. And the D7500 shoots 1080p video, but also gives you the option of 4K video. So we do consider that an upgrade, even though I don't urge people who are serious about video to choose that as their 4K video camera. Compared to the big brother, the D500, the D7500 is at a much lower price point, $1,250 compared to $2,000. That's $750 extra bucks that you can spend on lenses or a trip to wherever to get awesome pictures. And that might make more of a difference to your photography than, say, the extra two frames per second that the D500 offers you or the bigger raw buffer. Now, a 50-frame raw buffer on the D7500 is good, but at eight frames a second, that means that you're going to run out of buffer in about six seconds. So typically that's enough for flying birds or soccer. Most action sequences won't go on too much longer than that. Um, but there are times when I want to continue shooting, or you might shoot for six seconds and then need to promptly shoot for another six seconds and realize you still ran out of buffer from the last time. So the bigger buffer on the D500 
is fantastic. You always have the option of going down to JPEG, though, if the buffer becomes a problem. The D7500 does include an onboard flash. I hate onboard flash. I really never use it, though some people use it to trigger external flashes. The light quality from it doesn't tend to be great. Um, the D500 has a substantially better focusing system that stretches from corner to corner, and it includes uh, an amazing 3D tracking system. The D500 and the D5 simply have the best focusing system for sports and wildlife that we've ever, ever used. It's so much fun to use. It's just spot on, incredibly flat, fast. It tracks like crazy and it just reaches every corner. And for that, I really love it. Um, another advantage of the D500 when controlling those autofocus points, you can use the thumbstick, which the D7500 for some reason lacks a thumbstick. You have to use this less comfortable directional pad, less comfortable, less fast, less precise. The D500 includes, of course, includes two memory cards if you're one of those people who can't afford to lose shots. And it has a built-in focusing motor in case you use older Nikon lenses that don't have a built-in focusing motor. I think they took that out from the D7200 because most people don't care about that or use those lenses and they're looking to cut uh, costs in any way they can. Because remember, Nikon's having financial problems. They need to up their profit margin. So if they can find a feature that people don't care about and cut it, then that can help them out. And we want that. We actually want Nikon to make some money and be successful at this point. The D500 also had fantastic illuminated buttons that were fantastic. That, I'm using fantastic a lot. That were wonderful for night photography. Um, it's a nice little touch. It's not a big deal. Let's talk about the things that are disappointing with the D7500. Of course, it continues this legacy that started in the 80s of including ugly LCD screens on the, at the top. Other cameras have brought forth either e-ink displays that are they use very little battery and are viewable in all types of light and just look nicer and are reconfigurable, or color or even higher resolution black and white LCD displays. And just I don't know why they keep going with such a cheap, ugly, non-functional display. As I mentioned, it does not have good video AF. If you try to shoot video with it, I promise it's going to be a little bit of a frustrating experience. But if you're just an occasional video shooter, if you just want to record your kid's concert or something, it can be okay. No focus peaking for video. Um, it only has a single SD card. And of course, SnapBridge sucks. So don't count on it to transfer your files. If you're hoping to be able to quickly share files on vacation, you're just going to wreck your vacation with frustration. Probably. I know it works for some people. It's hit or miss. It works sometimes. It doesn't work other times. Okay, we're interested in the D7500. It has some key advantages. We'll definitely be recommending it for some key users. Let me know your thoughts down below and let me know what you'd like to see in our full review. You can subscribe to see the, our review and uh, we'll make a tutorial for it for people who buy it and want to figure out every aspect of it. Subscribe to see those. Thanks, guys. Give me a like. Bye.